Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Mike Bell, the Executive Director of the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. We're delighted today to have you here for our second day of our Memory Wars World War II at 75 and Beyond Conference. We had a great opening session yesterday on film in Hollywood. Today, we believe we have an amazing lineup of sessions for you as well. Our program wouldn't be possible if it were not for our presenting sponsors, the ABMC, the American Battle Monuments Commission, and EA, Respawn Entertainment, and Oculus by Meta. Thanks to their support, this conference is available and free to everyone. Today's first session, Never Again, The Holocaust in Public Memory and Discourse, features a panel of three professionals who have led the world's leading institutions concerned with the Holocaust. To chair this session, it's a pleasure to have with us another distinguished scholar and a friend of the museum, Dr. Ed Lowenthal, Professor Emeritus in the Department of History at Indiana University. After receiving his PhD from UC Santa Barbara, Ed spent 25 years in the Department of Religious Studies at the Univer University of Wisconsin Oshkosh before completing his career at the University of Indiana. A few highlights of his work includes the book Sacred Ground, Americans in Their Battlefields, Preserving Memory, The Struggle to Create America's Holocaust Museum. He was co-editor of History Wars, The Enola Gay and Other Battles for the American Past. Uh, interesting, he's also a member of the Flight 93 Memorial Commission and a visiting scholar of civic engagement with the National Park Service. As such, he worked for the NPS on the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. So it's my honor to turn this session over to Dr. Ed Lowenthal. Ed? Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here to uh, chair this session. Um, never again, question mark. And I think the question mark is important. The Holocaust in public memory and discourse. We have a panel that's ideally uh, situated to address these issues. And speaking in order will be Sarah J. Bloomfield, the director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Ronald Leopold, the executive director of the Anne Frank House, Dr. Darius Stola, uh, former director of the Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews. The format will be as follows. Each of our speakers will have approximately 10 minutes uh, to share with you. Um, we will then have between 20 and 30 minutes for a round table. And after that, 20, 30 minutes for audience uh, questions and r responses. So without uh, further ado, Sarah, would you kick off for us, please? Thank you, Ed. It's uh, great to be with you and to be with my other colleagues today. Um, as we know, memory is always a, a reflection of who is doing the remembering, why and when. And by memory, I'm speaking primarily here of memorials and museums rather than historic sites that have such unique responsibilities and opportunities. As our museum was being created, there was substantial criticism from parts of the general public, why would America build an institution to a European event? From parts of the Jewish community, wouldn't a government institution universalize the Holocaust and minimize its Jewish particularity? When the museum opened, it was clear it could be both historically accurate and universally relevant. Now, every word in our name, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, is significant. As part of the government, we're accountable to the American people, as represented by Congress. As a memorial, we are morally accountable to the victims and survivors. And as a museum, we have an obligation to our visitors to provide a meaningful educational experience. The museum's architecture and its exhibit design and content attempt to weave together memory, education, and relevance to visitors from all walks of life, and at the same time address the museum's location adjacent to the National Mall by speaking to American history and American values and providing an immersive experience about an event that happened to another people on another continent, a cataclysmic event launched by an advanced educated nation that before becoming a genocidal dictatorship had a democratic constitution, free speech, and a rule of law. 
The museum opened in 1993, almost five decades after the Holocaust. If it had opened a mere 25 years after the war, it would have been a different institution. Given the needs of the survivors at that time, the intensity of the Cold War, and the legacy of the 1960s, it could have resulted in an institution that might not have resonated as broadly as the museum does today. And even in 1993, we could not have imagined 9-11, the rise of violent extremism, or increasing anti-Semitism, racism, and Holocaust distortion, let alone an invasion of Ukraine on the pretext of denazification and genocide prevention. And just parenthetically, since we're convened today by the World War II Museum, I've been thinking a lot about what General Eisenhower, who predicted Holocaust denial, but perhaps not the weaponization of the Holocaust, would make of our world today. Now, it's important to reflect on some of the inherent tensions between memory and education, as the needs of survivors and visitors differ. To illustrate this, I wanted to share a few stories from our early years. I remember one day as we were working on the creation of the exhibition, a survivor coming up to me and saying, now, Sarah, of course the exhibition text will be in both English and Yiddish, won't it? It was a really powerful reminder to me of exactly what that exhibition was for him. More well-known, perhaps, is our debate about whether to display victims' hair. Our curators and designers had seen the mounds of hair displayed at Auschwitz and were overwhelmed by its power to convey the scale of the destruction and the humanity of the individual victims. Auschwitz agreed to lend the museum some hair, but some survivors were deeply upset as we continue to debate this. Several said, the thought that my mother's or sister's hair just might be on display is simply too painful for me to bear. And that sentiment was ultimately decisive. Later, after the museum opened, we had a request from the son of a man who was a victim of Nazi medical experiments. We had several pictures of his father on a monitor behind what we call privacy walls that were installed in front of our particularly graphic imagery. He felt the Germans had dehumanized and exploited his father, and in a way, we too were insulting his dignity, and he asked us to remove all of the images. After several hard discussions, weighing the educational value of each image and our commitment to honoring the victims, we decided to remove most, but not all, the photos of his father. Now, I want to say something about our educational approach. Our philosophy is to trust and respect our visitors, to not manipulate them or tell them what to think, but to let the events speak for themselves. Our exhibit text avoids using adjectives or adverbs, but we do punctuate the pedagogical exhibition with moments of intense emotive memory. For example, the glass bridges with engravings of individual victims' names or destroyed communities, our tower of faces, and the victims' shoes. But what is the value of memory if it's not relevant? For us, it's not enough that our visitors leave feeling the Holocaust was a horrific event or even asking themselves, what would I have done? We're seeking deeper self-reflection, critical thinking, and more questions about my own roles and responsibilities in society. What will I do? And to that end, we're revitalizing our exhibition to further enhance its relevance. This will inc include integrating events, stories, and universal themes. By the way, one of them is the critical role of the war. And focusing not only on what happened, but how and why, revealing the deep roots in German and European history that made the rise of Nazism and its impact across the continent possible. And deploying a strategy that we call multi-perspectivity to show how different people reacted in different situations, highlighting turning points and what in hindsight today we call warning signs. 
And finally, by reminding our visitors that history is never inevitable, but the result of many decisions at many points. I just want to conclude with some challenges we face. Memory, of course, depends on history. And there's a significant decline in history education in the United States. To my understanding that history majors were down more than any other. And furthermore, in secondary schools, the Holocaust is increasingly taught more so in language arts and English literature classes rather than as it used to be in social studies and history. In the broader context, there are other challenges. Getting people's attention. It's been said that human attention is the scarcest resource in the 21st century. And then there are the massive assaults on truth. Many, many decades, well before social media, a wise person said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting its pants on. As we all know, we face the politicization and instru instrumentalization of history and the declining influence of institutions. Although museums, who educate through authentic objects, are still among the more trusted institutions. But the question remains, can we continue to maintain that public trust across the divides? The Holocaust is a reminder that the unthinkable is always possible, that the world always changes, but human nature never does, that technological progress is not moral progress, and that we humans always seek simple answers to complex questions. The Holocaust will recede in time. Its relevance never will. That is memory's challenge and memory's opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Uh, let us turn now to uh, Ronald Leopold. The floor is yours, Ronald. Uh, as, you all, uh, as you all know, uh, the Anne Frank House uh, in Amsterdam is a, a very popular destination for many people that come to visit Amsterdam. 90% of our visitors are from abroad. 50% uh, of them are under the age of uh, 30. So we have a very, very young museum audience, and we're very happy, of course, about that. Um, but, we, uh, but we are, in a way, a, a, a special museum. And I think one of the main features of the museum is the fact that it's empty. Uh, an emptiness uh, that is, of course, uh, a telling feature of the fact, first and foremost, that Anne Frank is not with us anymore. She died at the age of 15 in the concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen in the beginning of 1945. Um, I think it's uh, also a telling emptiness because of her father, the only survivor of those who were in hiding in the secret annex. Uh, he returned to Amsterdam in, uh, in June 1945 uh, just to find a city that had lost 80,000 of its inhabitants. He himself, having lost his entire family, his wife and both his daughters. Um, and whenever you come to Amsterdam nowadays, you will not see that emptiness anymore. It's a vibrant, beautiful city. I'm a little biased, of course, because I live here. But those who have visited the city, I hope, uh, share my opinion on this. Nevertheless, this emptiness is something that is, for us who live here, very much tangible. Um, and for those who do not live here, um, is the Anne Frank House, I feel, that symbol of emptiness, which is so telling for what, have, what has happened here, not just in this city, in our country, in the entire continent. Um, but I feel that the meaning of, uh, of the Anne Frank House and its emptiness goes actually further than the tragedy in which it is rooted. Uh, this emptiness, the house, is also serving as a mirror, not just not to admire our beauty, of course, but to be confronted with who we are, with what makes us human and what human beings are capable of. The fate of Anne Frank was the work of human hands. It was not the result of a natural disaster. It was not the work from creatures from other planets. It was not even the work of a specific type of human being. It was the work of human beings as such. And as 
uh, as a museum and an educational organization, we invite our visitors and those who participate in our educational uh, activities to reflect on this, to ask themselves questions, often uncomfortable questions, about our moral compass. Questions about the choices that we make and the consequences these choices have for ourselves, but also for others. And Father Otto, he remarked shortly because before the Anne Frank House opened in 1960, that we should stop teaching history lessons. I quote Otto Frank. We should stop teaching history lessons and we should start teaching the lessons from history. Now, especially among an esteemed acad uh, academic uh, uh, audience, I would not claim that we should stop teaching history lessons, but I think uh, his intrinsic message was very clear. History lessons are of little use if they do not also serve us as a mirror for our own actions. The question, of course, is what are those lessons from history? What is the relevance of the Holocaust in the 21st century for generations whose grandparents and sometimes even their great-grandparents were born after the end of the Second World War? Aren't the circumstances and events of the past too distant from us? Can they still have a guiding significance in 2022? Was the English novelist L.P. Hartley right when he wrote in 1953 in the opening lines of his novel, The Go-Between, and I quote Hartley, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. End of quote. Well, do they? A well-known Dutch historian once said that history has nothing to teach us, but does give us food for thought. It helps us in the search for the significance of the past in light of the many, many differences and a handful of similarities with the present. It prevents us from putting historical and contemporary developments and circumstances on par with each other. But it does not stop there. History gives us food for thought, not so much because history repeats itself but because it offers us a view of what lies behind the way human beings think and act, what motivated them to think and act the way they did. We try to understand political and social circumstances and developments of today in the light of what happened in the lead up to and during the Holocaust. And I do this with an increasing sense of urgency and uneasiness. What are the driving forces behind today's growing social divide? Behind the increasingly freer use of words and ideas that were completely taboo until not so long ago. Anyone who has thought about World War II and the Holocaust inevitably comes up with the question of how things could have gone so far. What moment might history have taken a different turn? And in, 19, and in 2022, that question also raises an urgent contemporary dilemma related to democratic vigilance. What do we see and hear around us? How do we read our own time? How do we interpret the risks? Are we slipping away? Are we losing control of developments? Is our open democratic society and the rule of law, which we build with so much care in the shadow of the Holocaust, in danger? Are we en route to new tragedies? There is a reason comparisons are made with the 1930s and that discussions about these comparisons have increasingly become part of today's discourse. We hear language, we see comparisons, we see images that distinctly remind us of those years. 
And it no longer comes only from marginal groups on the fringes of society, not only from the darkest corners of the internet. It's being displayed on billboards along the road. I just remind you of the billboards of George Soros during the Hungarian election campaign. It's found on the opinion papers, serious newspapers. It's been expounded in the election campaigns of very successful politicians. But surely it will not happen to us again in a relatively short span of time that we miss the turn, that we miss the moment to turn the tide of history, that we let the window to act pass us by while the warning lights from the past flash brighter and brighter, that we are going to make the same mistake twice. The democratic constitutional states and the open societies that we build in the shadow of the war in many European countries, sometimes after decades of oppression, the kinds of societies in which power is controlled and limited by independent institutions, in which citizens in the great diversity are not only equal under the law, but also treated equally, in which politicians not only attempt to realize their own ideals, but take the ideals and interests of all citizens in, in consideration, in which citizens realize that they are part of a greater community of people with very different backgrounds, very different beliefs, even very different value systems, and act accordingly. These societies are increasingly under threat. Freedom House an independent organization that monitors the development of freedom and democracy in the world, notes year after year, very recently they published the latest report, that freedom and democracy are declining worldwide. Those are disturbing findings. And all of this after we've said to ourselves for years and certainly at commemorations, that freedom and democracy must not be taken for granted, that you must care for them and sometimes fight for them. We have always told ourselves that we must be vigilant, that the ghosts of the past don't vanish just like that, that anti-Semitism, racism and discrimination are of all times. But history has hit back hard and forced us to think again, to think and to act. Because our societies, the ones that we so passionately believe in, are not simple societies, certainly not in times of radical changes like ours. These societies must stand firm against ideas that appeal to the fear of change, that promise certainty, that put their own people first above equality. They must stand their ground in the discord created by radical voices who primarily spout off at the mouth for the benefit of particular interest groups or about how right they are. They must survive in a world dominated by the pursuit of power rather than the pursuit of humanity. They must endure amidst an exploding media landscape in which just about every citizen has its own press agency. It's important to realize that Anne Frank's short life began in 1929 in a free and democratic country, Germany, and ended a mere 15 years later in a world of total barbarism. This malevolence did not begin with the outbreak of World War II. It started in the years 1932 and 1933 with the rapid demise of German democracy and Nazi takeover of powers. The establishment of a strong anti-Semitic Nazi dictatorship made Jews living in Germany, 0.8% of the population, question whether they should stay. It must have been inconceivable for families who had lived on German territory for centuries, who felt connected to the country, language and culture, and who had fought for their homeland during the First World War. 
I don't believe that we are facing that same inconceivable question at this moment. But I do believe there is every reason to be more vigorously defend our open democratic societies and the rule of law. And I am convinced that organization like, organizations like ours can and must make an important contribution to this. Because these open and democratic societies are the best way to fend off new tragedies, to protect ourselves against ourselves. We have endeavored for years to combat anti-Semitism, racism and discrimination within the framework of relatively stable democratic constitutional states. But now those frameworks themselves are under fire. And I therefore call on us to focus more on strengthening those frameworks, on stimulating and supporting the basic principles with which we negotiate our sometimes very large differences. We will not only have to identify the values that bind us, we also have to develop an ability to address what divides us. We will have to redefine what democratic thinking means in the 21st century and how we can develop it in the shadow of the memory of the Holocaust and especially what preceded it. How we can keep our community sustainable amidst the major challenges presented by a world that seems to become more and more dangerous. How, in the interest of that community, and therefore of ourselves, can we build relationships with those who differ or appear to differ from us? How we can open ourselves to one another, how we can try to understand each other. The 16th president of your great country, Abraham Lincoln, once said, and I quote Lincoln, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better, end of quote. Wise words spoken by a wise man. For organizations that are committed worldwide to keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive, I see this as the most important part in the coming uh, task in the coming years, ensuring that our democratic constitutional states continue to function well. That requires not only a foundation of common values, but also skills and competences that enable us to deal with our differences. At schools, in sport clubs, in villages and towns where we live, nationwide, worldwide. And to conclude, I feel that there is one more thing that we need in order to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive. We've been spoken for many years about the consequences of the gradual disappearance of the generation of survivors, of those who experienced the Holocaust firsthand and who have deeply touched us by sharing their painful experiences and memories. Just a few of them are still alive. And of course, we hope to keep them with us for as long as possible. But at the same time, we see that young people, we see that uh, our target group increasingly consists of young people whose grandparents were born after the war. The question I ask is whether Holocaust organizations have and maintain enough of a connection with this contemporary everyday context. Wouldn't it be better if we work, if we took the context as a starting point for a Holocaust educational experience instead of a history lesson? In, term, in the words of Otto Frank. And shouldn't we engage young people more in our efforts? Shouldn't we invite them to become part of our organizations in one form or another? I think we need to consider them more as co-creators, as partners in our educational efforts, much more than target audiences. They could help us fulfill our missions. They could help us to build the world of their dreams. They offer us new perspectives, which are accompanied by new connotations. Let us consider how we can actively involve young people in our work, in our organizations. Let us make place for them. Let us listen to them. Let us welcome them with open arms. It is
it is my experience that there are many, many of them who are very talented and young and committed, sometimes incredibly young, from it we can learn a lot. I conclude with Anne Frank and the very last sentence of a diary, which speaks volumes. I quote Anne, I keep on trying to find a way to become what I would like to be and what I could be if, if only there were no other people in the world. Let me be myself, a classic quote from the diary of Anne Frank, not as an identity claim, but as an individual desire and a democratic endeavor to give everybody the opportunity and freedom to discover and develop themselves. It's not going to give us the best of all possible worlds, worlds, but hopefully it will spare us the hell that Anne Frank and millions of others were forced to endure. They were not only prohibited from being their true selves, but from being at all. Thank you. Ronald, thank you so much. Uh, let's turn now to Darius Stola. Darius, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to this panel. Uh, uh, the Polish Museum of the History of Polish Jews is the youngest of the three museums that you have heard about in, in this session. But what is special about is not so much it's uh, more an exhibition, but this location. The museum stands in front of the monument to the heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto, in the middle of what was this largest ghetto in German-occupied Europe. Uh, but this is not a Holocaust museum, or more exactly, it's not only a Holocaust museum. It shows all the history of Polish Jews down to the Middle Ages, and while the monument shows how the prisoners of the Warsaw Ghetto died, how they fought and died, our museum shows how they had lived, them and their parents, their grandparents, their great-great-parents, almost 1,000 years in Poland, historically. Uh, to understand the Holocaust in public memory today, we need to consider at least three factors. One, what was the original experience of the eyewitness, the non-Jewish Poles watching the horrible tragedy of the Jewish neighbors under German occupation? Second is how the stories of, of this experience were transmitted from one generation to another. And third, how it was becoming a cultural memory, a memory embodied in monuments in arts and films and books and public policies and speeches of the political leaders. So first, uh, Poland was the main side of the genocide. Polish Jews, Poland had the largest Jewish community in Europe before the war, some 3.4 million people, and 90% of them perished during the Second World War, which means that Polish Jews made most of the victims of the Holocaust. Moreover, Hundreds of thousands of Jews from other European countries, from Greece to Norway, were deported to the death camps that Nazis had established in German-occupied Poland, places like Treblinka, Bełżec, Sobibur, and Auschwitz. Uh, finally, uh, about a third of Polish Jews did not perish in the gas chambers in the isolated areas close to the eye of, of the witness but were executed nearby their hometowns in mass executions, so-called Holocaust by ballots, like most of the East European Jews in Eastern Poland and the Western parts of the, of the Soviet Union. That means within sight. So there were many non-Jewish Poles who could hear and see or smell the, the, the horrible smell of the, of the mass killing, which made Poland not only the site of the crime, but also the scene of the crime. And as Michael Steinlauf, my American colleague, historian, once said, if Holocaust was unprecedented in many of its aspects of a, as a crime, also witnessing it was unprecedented in many aspects. So the, including the reaction of, of the non-Jewish Poles, who themselves were persecuted horribly by the Nazis, but not to the extent that the Jews were persecuted. 
And while 90% of Polish Jews perished during the war, 90% uh, of non-Jewish Poles survived the war, which means some 10% of the non-Jewish population, Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and, and others, other citizens of, of pre-war Poland, died. But still, that was a, a small minority comparing to the scale of the Jewish catastrophe. So the reactions of, the, of this non-Jewish witness varied. Some of them <clears throat> assisted the killers. Some of them assisted the victims, a great majority remained passive, or we don't know anything about what they did or failed to do during the war. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is important because after the war and up to the recently, much of the knowledge of the Holocaust was transmitted in private narratives of parents, grandparents, uncles, neighbors, colleagues, up to the recently, because I've, it was already said today, the generation of the survivors of the Holocaust, the generation of the eyewitness of the Holocaust is passing. We see the last of them. This is the last moment to ask them questions. They will be no longer with us soon. But so far, it largely depends on these private narratives, which is important, especially for the communist period, more than for the case of the communist rule. And communists in Poland, like elsewhere in the Soviet bloc, had uh, their own ways of distorting the past. They did not hide Nazi crimes, rather the opposite. The knowledge about the crimes committed by Nazi Germany were hammered into our heads. I remember myself as a schoolboy in communist Poland, how often it was a topic. But the fact that most of the Polish victims of the Holocaust were killed as Jews, that was marginalized and distorted. Maybe not to the extent it was the case in the Soviet Union, where monuments, memorials to the victims of the Second World War were victims to the peace-loving citizens of the Soviet Union, without mentioning that most of the civilian victims were actually Jewish. In Poland, it was clear the monuments in places like Treblinka or Auschwitz did not hide that it was the fate of the Jews, but this knowledge was somehow blurred. And killing of the Jews just was just one of several major crimes committed by the Nazis in German occupied Poland. This started to change in the late 1980s and underwent a very important change throughout the 1990s and, and, and this century, Prima, not only by the reform of the educational system in democratic Poland, by remaking of museum exhibitions, including the exhibition of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Museum, but to a large extent by a series of major public discussions. I have analyzed some 14 of major public debates involving national media lasting at least several weeks, if not months, that engage not just the educated public, the media personalities or political leaders, but thousands of people. This series culminated in the early 2000s, following the publication of a little book by uh, a, a, a Polish exile historian, Professor Jan Tomasz Gross, then a, a historian in the United States, uh, a little book, uh, The Neighbors, about the killing of Jews in the small town of Yedwabne in what was the Soviet zone of occupation 1939-1941 and was invaded by, the, by Nazi Germany in the summer of 1941, when uh, local Jewish population was killed in a horrible manner, primarily by the Christian Polish neighbors, with limited involvement of German officers, primarily by the hands of, of, the, of the Christian neighbors. And that was a kind of a, of a shock for the Polish public. That was not only the biggest debate on the Holocaust in Poland, it was the biggest debate on history in Poland ever. It lasted almost two years, with hundreds of articles, thousands of speeches on TV and radio and internet, uh, including important statements by the president of Poland, the spiritual leaders of, 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 of churches, uh, uh, artists, writers, philosophers, but also ordinary people. And public opinions showed that more than 85% of, of the population of the country was aware of this debate, could locate, could say something about the town of Yedwabne, about which you know, no one had heard before a small town in eastern Poland today. And this change was important. This debate was, I believe, also important for the establishment of the Pauline Museum, the museum was established as a public-private partnership in 2005, so just a few years after this debate, uh, a partnership between the 
the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute, which represents the Jewish community of Warsaw and historians, the city of Warsaw and the Ministry of Culture. And through a very multi-partisan political support and substantial public funding, this beautiful museum was, the building was erected, and then we opened the core exhibition in 2014. And that was the best known outcome of these many debates, but there were many more of them. Changes in small museums, educational projects, uh, commemorative campaigns, r really hundreds of them, and, and especially those who are small scale, very grassroots in the small Polish towns where the Jews had made before the war an important part of the population th that I think were, were especially worth mentioning. In the last decade, we have seen a kind of the backlash against this major change, bringing the Holocaust to the center of the Polish memory of the 20th century and the Second World War. Because, as I said, German occupation, the catastrophe of the Second World War has been, since the war, has been the primary topic of, of, of public memory. But the, the, the Jewish part of, of the story was somehow marginalized. So in the last decade, we have seen kind of a backlash, not the people who tried to, to negate the Holocaust, not at all, but who try to uh, change the proportions. Uh, they uh, inflate the scale of the assistance given to the Jews by, by non-Jewish Poles. They minimize the scale of collaboration and private preying on the Jewish tragedy by, by non-Jewish Poles. And these actions included uh, legislation, which was to penalize some statements, uh, excuse me, some statements on the Polish complicity in the Nazi crimes in 2018, or legal harassment of, of historians, my colleagues, Holocaust historians. So despite this backlash, I believe that this process of the relocation of the Holocaust from relative margins of public remembrance in Poland to the center of it has been continuing. And the, 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 the most recent debates, even if they were nasty, and the fact that the main forum are social media, which are guided by algorithms supporting controversial statements, emotional statements, actually fake news, not helping uh, a decent, frank, sincere approach to, to, to difficult past. Even in these debates, the, the, the importance of the Holocaust is coming again and, and again. And I think this process is ir irreversible. Uh, but let me end my, my intervention here we have a statement about the very present moment. Uh, just yesterday, I was listening to Marian Turski, uh, Auschwitz survivor, and also the chair of the Pauline Museum Advisory Board, speaking at the university in Poland, who stressed the importance of this cry never again. And that this cry never again now demands us not to stand passive in front of the Russian aggression in Ukraine in front of shelling of Ukrainian cities, indiscriminate targeting of civilians, and this perverse claims of the Russian president that this is to denazify Ukraine. I think if we don't respond to these crimes, these horrors happening right next door, really, you know, we can see more than 2 million Ukrainian refugees in, in, in crossing the borders. Uh, uh, we will not stand to the call of the people who were eyewitness, who were the survivors of the Holocaust and who left us with this cry, never again. So let, don't allow to happen it now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, there are uh, any number of, of issues on the floor. All of you have had a chance to listen uh, to each other. So as we move into a period now, uh, where we talk together before we open it in 20 minutes or so to questions from the audience. Uh, what what things would you like to talk about with each other's questions, comments, insights uh, you had as as you listen to um, to each presentation? Uh, I think that would be very interesting if you could share some of those. So the floor is open to any of you who uh, want to, to push on something. Well, I'll chime in with something. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, you know, Darius ended with something, you know, 
very, um, very large and, and feeling very existential for all of us right now. But uh, I want to go back to something that was said about uh, engaging our audiences in, in how we do our work. And that's something that the museum has also identified as an area that we need to do much better in, and um, that we're doing a lot of visitor research, uh, particularly of young people. And we found a couple of things that I just think are very interesting. And, you know, some of them seem obvious, some of them seem counterintuitive. Uh, one is that, and we actually studied them uh, coming on school group visits before they visited the museum, their visit at the museum and afterwards, but also while they're in the museum and their particular interaction with certain exhibitions. And what we've found is that, not surprisingly, less is more, that in many of our displays, we have too much going on, too many videos, too many photographs. And when you start removing them, the, they they engage much more deeply and begin to understand what we're trying to uh, convey. Secondly, scale is so large in the Holocaust that it's hard to convey. And a lot of times the scale of the Holocaust and the speed of the Holocaust is missing and, and hard for them to grasp. And then just a last thing about technology, uh, we experimented with one exhibition about some interactive technology where people could uh, use their phones to find out uh, something more about a person that they were that we were featuring, and they weren't using they weren't doing this, and so we asked young people why they weren't, and they said to us, you know, we don't come to a museum to use our cell phone, we come to have a different kind of experience, and I think you know it's important that our own assumptions that we have about the audience uh, always need to be tested. So this is something we continue to work on. So again, a very technical uh, point uh, in light of the very the, the much larger issues my, my colleagues raised, but I would just start with that. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, well, let me ask uh, all of you, just following up <clears throat> on Sarah's comments, several years ago uh, when I was in Oklahoma City, um, about which I've, I've written, uh, they, I was just stunned by the brilliant redo of, of the permanent exhibition. And uh, Kerry Watkins, who's been the executive director at the Oklahoma City uh, Memorial, talked about the importance of um, doing this for the next generations. She kept uh, her children and all children in mind, uh, how they now are, are processing um, a history and uh, the the visual learning that's so important to to so many of them, um, and I, I I found that um, in a kind of negative way uh, when I spent uh, a lot of time over the last years at the 9/11 Memorial and Museum in New York City, and I was taken aback by how many people were not looking at. Uh, the materials in the exhibition themselves, they were looking at it through their cell phones, uh, holding up the cell phones. So uh, I'm asking all of you, I guess, uh, because I'm, I still think of slide projectors as sort of cutting edge technology. Um, you know, what, uh, what is the challenge of the digital world and, and new ways of learning uh, that that you have found, uh, and what are the successful ones that that you found? So, uh, for any of you, I'm really interested in in what you have to say about this. So, if I may, because our exhibition was opened relatively recently, so it was designed in the early 2000s and and eventually produced in 2013, 2014, relatively recently. Now, being the director, the first thing I learned is that uh, nothing ages as fast as the newest technology. What is new technology today is no longer new technology next year. So the whole idea that you may appeal to the young people using the new technology is just misplaced. It, it doesn't work. Or you have to change it again and again, which is r rather impossible and, and for a variety of reasons. Second, and this way, I learned from a person who actually came to the museum to sell us a product, a product which was something between a, 
uh, an audio guide with some visual materials on the screen, but eventually he told me in his striking sincerity that in some cases, it's not good when technology stands between the visitor and the original object, a material eyewitness of a, of, of a past. And I think that was, that was for me the, the, the key comment. We shouldn't put in between the visitor and an original artifact coming from a past and a technology. This authenticity, the fact that the visitors can see, sometimes even touch something, is crucial for the museum experience. What is on the screen, they can see anywhere. Uh, uh, and so th these are the, the, the reasonable limits of applying the technology. Otherwise, technology is, is useful, for example, to solve the continuous battle between historians and curators. And historians like me, we, we, we thought it took me a long time to, to actually understand I was wrong, that the more content we provide, it's better. No, it's, it's not true. Less is more, certainly. And I agree with what Sarah has just said. So multimedia are good because you can put a lot of information into the into the computers for more interested public and at the same time not to to to, to put too much of the information on display in the gallery mm, thank you yeah, it's Ronald. interesting that yeah well it's interesting that we have a kind of reverse problem uh, as i just mentioned uh, the, the the house is an empty museum it's probably the only museum in the world that doesn't that much else to offer than empty spaces so less is more is, uh, has really uh, become uh, the main feature of the Anne Frank House, you could say. Um, but when we, uh, when we revitalized our uh, exhibition a few years ago, um, actually we started with, uh, with asking uh, several you know, people from all walks of life and, and many young people just to walk through the museum like it was and give us back you know, what, they, what they think of it. And, um, one of the there were actually three points that 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 they uh, that they gave us feedback on, which was one a very important one. I think Sarah just uh, already mentioned it in her introduction that there was not a lot of things they learned about the history of Anne, about the context and its uh, and its backgrounds. Um, so we were thinking about how to solve that problem, which is something that we already noticed also because of the young audience that the museum is attracting. And um, actually, uh, we decided for that reason, because we wanted to preserve the emptiness. We wanted to preserve the, the, the atmosphere of the, of the house, the atmosphere of the hiding place. So uh, for that reason, we decided to uh, introduce an audio tour uh, in order to give people more background information and context without changing uh, the, 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 the core of the atmosphere of, uh, of the Anne Frank House. So it's not so much something that stands in between, like Daria Sewin, which I recognize from, from my museum experience in other museums, not so much something that stands in between the artifact and, uh, and the visitor, but something that really adds to the experience in order to have a meaningful visit to, uh, to the Anne Frank House when you come to visit us without bringing a lot of knowledge and sometimes even no knowledge at all about the historical, uh, the historical background of, uh, of the house. Um, I think uh, one of the, and, and I try to mention that in my, uh, in my introduction, I think one of the things we really need to look into is the fact that there is a kind of a missing chapter when, uh, when we only listen to young people and try to translate that with our knowledge and skills into uh, revitalizing museums or into uh, designing our educational programs and materials. I think we really should ask them to work together with us. We have a long tradition at the Anne Frank House in our educational work with peer education. We're currently building an international network of young people, the International uh, Youth Network of the Anne Frank House, to uh, help us carrying out the educational activities worldwide, um, also in the Netherlands, also on site in the museum. So I think uh, in order to, to, to um, facilitate the, 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 the shift in generations, it has been mentioned many times, we unfortunately, there are still only very few eyewitnesses alive, and we need to think about how memory is being transmitted 
from a generation that was already born after the war to their, to their children and grandchildren. Um, and, and one of the things uh, is what I, what I would like to add to that is not just to incorporate them into our institutions, but also to open up to their experiences with the Holocaust, their ways of how they connect to the history, oftentimes in very unfortunate ways. I could only mention, you know, the selfies that are being made in front of museums or in the concentration camps. But the way they connect to history is very different from, uh, from ours. And I think we need to, as educators, we need to open uh, ourselves to these points of entry and try to consider them as a start of an inter educational intervention rather than the start of a judgment. Thank you. L let me follow up with you on, uh, on that. Uh, and for all of you, as, as you think about challenges you, in your own exhibitions, do you see, Ronald, uh, in young or old people who come uh, with this kind of romantic vision of Anne Frank and there is sort of regrettable uh, focus on her sense that you know all people are are good and those sorts of things. She's this kind of symbol of uh, the loss of of young innocence, uh, and it's a sort of redemptive story rather than the horrible history of what happened to this fifteen year old girl. So as you all try to historicize her and place her in time and place as a as a real person, do you see visitors? beginning to, you know, be burdened and to think about that historicization? Uh, do, they, do they leave with a more sober uh, uh, view of this story and the challenges than they come in with? Question for me, to, when it comes yeah. to the Anne Frank House? Yeah. yeah. You know, I think we need to do two things for the future. The first thing is, you know, we, we, we know that their knowledge of the history is becoming less and less. And it's not just about these young people coming to the museum, or, but it's also, I also see it among professionals. I also see it among journalists. I also see it among you know, professional walks of life where, where you can really see that there is a profound knowledge lacking in when it comes to the history of, uh, of Anne Frank. So I think we need to, in our case, I think our ambition is that we want to be that one institution that if you really want to know what happened on a, on a rely, with, based on reliable research, uh, uh, that's what we want to be. Um, making use, of course, of research that has been done everywhere in the world. But I think this is really important to have a very admi uh, um, uh, admissible, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, an, uh, a way that easily give access to profound knowledge of the history of Anne Frank. But at the same time, I feel that we would miss an opportunity in order to, if we do not open ourselves to the very, very different ways people are and will connect to the story, the points of entry they are looking for. And I'm a little bit afraid that if we historicize a little too much, that we will lose that opportunity and therefore lose audiences that are initially um, appealed to the story and attracted to the story and interested in the story. Mm, thank you. Uh, so uh, questions, I, I have lots of things percolating in my mind, but I'll contain myself then uh, if any of you have questions for each other. You represent such important institutions it's uh, it's a treat to listen to you talk with each other. Can I? Uh, I just want to jump in on on something Ronald said, and I alluded to it briefly. You know, uh, it's it's about the authenticity of a historic site, and it's about I think a question, especially in the light of uh, you know the rise of the internet, and that we all live in cyberspace, is what is the role of authentic sites or authentic objects in this world? I think they sometimes take on even greater significance. And when we've done some research with our visitors, 
and ask them, a lot of them will tell us that, well, I had a general idea of the Holocaust before I came here. Often, by the way, it's from seeing Schindler's List, reading Anne Frank. Uh, but my experience at the museum made me understand it in a deeper way. And when you probe and try to find out why, uh, it turns out it's, it's seeing the real thing. They start to cite uh, the railroad car used for deportations, the uh, barracks from Birkenau, the victim's shoes. So I think that this is what museums uniquely do when we make a very important contribution in the world in this kind of informal education. And I think that's something we should seize. Um, I don't think we have to seize, as, as Daria said, being technologically innovative. Uh, I think we have our own lane, and it's a very powerful one. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I remember um, <laughs> and, and you do um, more than, than any of us, uh, Seika Weinberg, the, the late director of, of the museum in Washington, um, wanted the museum to be a storytelling museum. And so the, the power of those stories uh, is, is compelling. Uh, other questions for for each other, Darius. Anything that's that's I would like percolate? To follow up on this last point by Sarah, it reminded me immediately what Piotr Cywinski, the director of the Auschwitz Memorial Museum, has told me that uh, watching the emotionality of the visitors, you know, walking, passing through the area of the of the camp in Auschwitz Birkenau, you know. The, the, the place they see, uh, the relics of the barracks they see, and so on. It's, it's very emotional, first of all, and uh, the guides and the educators are trained, prepared, you know, to be ready for outbursts of emotionality, of, of variety of different emotions. And he called it a rite of passage. That means people entering the museum and people leaving the museum are different. Something happens in them. It's maybe, you know, more lasting or, or, or short term. But there is something changing them relatively profoundly. And, you know, I still remember my own first visit to the Auschwitz Museum when I was a teenager back, you know, in the, in the secondary school. So it must be powerful. It remains powerful for, for, for teenagers, for teenagers to do. Uh, the difference when we speak about the younger generation is, and this is inevitable, they have other interests. They ask new questions, the questions that we, it's difficult to anticipate. Uh, and the power of, of, of original scenes and, 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 and artifacts is that they may respond to different questions. Our stories may be uh, biased in a way by the kind of questions that our generation has or, or has had, and that may be different to the questions which the new generations will, will have. But the power of the original artifact is in the capacity to offer them answers to a whole variety of new questions. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Darius, I was May thinking. I? Uh, yes, please, Rana, go ahead. Well, j just a few words uh, because I, I very much agree with uh, with, with this uh, what uh, Darius and, B and Sarah uh, said. I think what I see at the Anne Frank House is a is a, a what what Johan Huizinga is one of the one of the uh, best historians uh, this country have produced. He uh, mentioned this a historical sensation. You take you take in uh, the nearness of a of an artifact from the past brings you very close to that past. And I think one of the elements when we are talking about less is more is also, uh, and I go back to the feedback that we received from uh, before we revitalized the, 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 the exhibit inside the house, is also very much about the mindset of people, those who are visiting our museums, and uh, are responding to it in a very emotional way, which in, to a certain extent limits their capacity in order to learn in a more cognitive way at the very same time. So I think in, in designing exhibits uh, has also to do with this dynamic of the visit in terms of where you are connecting, where visitors are connecting in a very emotional way to what they experience inside a museum and where there is place for more, like the, uh, more you. cognitive, more information. Yeah. Other other questions for each other. I think I think we're getting near the time where uh, MC will open this 
uh, two questions from the audience for for all of you. Um, if I if I could just say a, a couple of things, um, I'm really intrigued by the the title of the session. Never again? Question mark. The Holocaust in public memory and discourse. Um, the first part of it, never again, which has been uh, uh, a response on uh, an emotional level for many, many people over decades. Now, I respect the energy of the conviction with which people say it, but it's always seemed to be a, a kind of formulaic out for responding to the unspeakable, but we have to speak it. I mean, shouldn't it be, do you all think, uh, instead of never again, will it ever stop? And that that's the challenge of all of your institutions and um, the Holocaust studies. Um, so that's sort of one thing I thought about as I looked at this title. And the other, the Holocaust in public memory and uh, discourse, um, as is clear from these presentations, um, public memory is different. In, in different countries. So there are different challenges, different issues, different kinds um, of discourses. Uh, viewers might be interested in reading a brilliant book by uh, James Young, um, who was one of the leading uh, scholars of Holocaust representation. One of his books uh, uh, deals with different uh, ways of, the, uh, of thinking about the Holocaust um, in different countries. The texture of meaning, Holocaust uh, memorial and, and meaning. Um, I think also uh, about this public presentation of indigestible stories that I think it's a huge challenge for any historical and memorial institutions. What are the stories that so threaten a kind of public identity that people resist thinking about them uh, at all. Darius talked about the controversies uh, in Poland over the complex relationships between uh, uh, Poland and, and the Holocaust. Uh, remember not so many years ago, the uh, uproar over the exhibition uh, in Germany um, portraying the Wehrmacht as being deeply complicit um, in the Holocaust. Uh, so I wonder, just not just for Holocaust institutions, how do we present and change minds, if that's even possible, uh, about indigestible stories? Is there a way to, uh, to talk about these? Are there still stories in the world of the Holocaust that are indigestible? that uh, simply can't be talked about yet in uh, um, memorials or, or museums. Um, any any uh, thoughts about, about that from the panel? Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Oh. Yeah, Sarah, go ahead, please. Okay, so just, uh, I'll just start, and my colleagues, I'm sure we'll, we'll finish this off uh, powerfully, but just about never again, uh, we've done some testing about what never again means, and it turns out that it resonates with a lot of people. They find something very compelling and even inspiring in that phrase, because like you, we kind of think it's really ever again, right? Isn't that the reality since 1945? And it feels trite to us. Uh, but something else that we use a little bit more than that uh, it goes back to our opening day when Ellie Wiesel said that the museum is not an answer, it's a question. And I think we would say the museum is many questions. And one of our mottos that, that, that our visitors see around the museum is never stop asking why, uh, because that engages the visitor in asking these endless questions, which historians continue to ask all the time, is trying to understand that why. And of course, we hope it takes them back to their own self-reflection. Um, and as for the point about stories, uh, I do believe that that change is possible through the power of, of good storytelling. As you said, that was Shaika Weinberg's 
uh, insight from the beginning. His background uh, was in theater. Um, but I, I keep on my desk every day something, a quote I heard actually from Ken Burns, but it's by an author, Richard Powers, and he wrote, the best arguments in the world won't change a single mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. And I think constantly thinking about how do we do this powerful storytelling so that people who don't see this uh, history as having meaning for them can find a way, an entryway into the history, and maybe we have the chance to take them to a different place. Yeah, that's very helpful, Sarah. Well said, thank you. Uh, Ronald, Derish, uh, comments at all? Yes, uh, your question about the topics that the public don't want to listen about, you know, I have seen it in Poland how the boundaries of what the public is ready to admit and think about been moving. I remember the big debate, early debate, still in Communist Poland, 1987, when Professor Jan Błoński raised the topic of, of passivity, of indifference in the face of, of the Jewish tragedy. And that was a very controversial, there were many voices, you know, harshly criticizing him. And yet no one at this moment, including Professor Błoński, was ready to admit that the problem was not just about passivity of, of, of many non-Jewish Poles, but it, there was a problem of a very active involvement of complicity in, in, in the Nazi crimes. And this question came uh, some 12 years later. So it took a long time and some of seven debates of the 1990s to actually to move the public opinion to the points of readiness. I'm pretty sure that if Jan Tomasz Gross published his book not in 2000s in Poland, but in 1990, we wouldn't have had such a great debate as we had because we didn't have a language. It took some time to develop a language to talk about. It's not about just sensitivity, kind of emotions, but also our ability to articulate certain topics. So with, in, in due time, you can push the boundaries. Thank, I, thank you. Uh, let me do a quick correction on myself, uh, James. The title of this book by James Young uh, is The Texture of Memory, Holocaust Memorials and, uh, and Meaning. Um, well, I think we're uh, coming close to the time when we're going to open this to uh, the public. So, and there is Mike to do that right now. Panelists, thank you. This has been really quite wonderful. Well, th thank you, Ed, and our panel for some uh, really insightful discussion and, and provocative uh, ideas and questions. Uh, and now we're going to we're going to turn to our our audience and see uh, the question. The first one's going to go to Sarah about the U.S. Uh, uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum. You know, Sarah, how much does the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum address anti-Semitism in Poland and Russia before, during, and after the Second World War? So it's a great question. Uh, we do have a film that focuses on the history of European anti-Semitism. So our visitors are overwhelmingly not Jewish. Um, they sometimes I've even been asked by some visitors, you know, what is anti-Semitism? So we do have a film uh, that provides the background of uh, roughly 2,000 years of European anti-Semitism and how it began uh, as a religious form of anti-Semitism, but as Europe grew more industrialized and more secular, uh, different forms of anti-Semitism emerged. Um, so it explains kind of the environment which uh, made it possible not only for Nazism itself, but for all the people who ended up collaborating with the Nazis uh, across uh, German-dominated Europe, it helps explain uh, a lot of that motivation. Um, but I would say that one of the problems is that we do that in one film, and if our visitors miss that film, they really miss the background here. And, you know, Nazism was not um, a meteorite that fell from the sky. It had deep roots in German and European history, uh, and anti-Semitism is a very deep one, and we have to do a better job of that. Well, thanks. And uh, next one's for, for Ronald about the Anne Frank House. You know, what major changes uh, in the way the Anne Frank House operates uh, now uh, versus in the past with the, the uh, wider uh, audience that you have? 
Oh, thank you so much. It's a real great question. Uh, I think um, let me let me start by saying what has remained the same, which is basically the experience of the visiting the hiding place. Um, uh, everything else uh, is uh, has changed over the years, I think, uh, and also from the uh, also because the the, the um, because of the popularity of the museum. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we had 1.3 million visitors uh, every year, which is a huge challenge in order to give each and everyone who wishes to to visit the house uh, to give the opportunity to do so. While at the same time, you want to remain a certain standard of quality. Of, uh, of that visit. Um, so I think many of the changes that we uh, that we have uh, put through has had to do with the logistics of the uh, of the of the visit. Um, I think the second thing which uh, which is really important content wise is the fact that um, in the spirit of Auto Frank, this has always been a place with a strong educational mission, and um, so we always. Uh, have ended the, the the tour through the museum with kind of educational uh, a program or materials or videos, and I uh, I think what I mentioned earlier that this dynamics of a visit to a museum in terms of the mindset is is really uh, giving us a huge challenge in order to make the switch and the shift from from coming from an, a very ex emotional space like the hiding place and then going to the to the space where we where we have the original diaries on display all of a sudden going into a, a different a different room where you are confronted with all kinds of contemporary issues regarding anti-semitism racism discrimination uh, so so that is that is real that was really a challenge and we changed that also to make that more like a smooth transfer from from the more historical part to the contemporary part um, and as I earlier mentioned we had we had to add more knowledge into the museum by providing through an audio tour uh, because we feel that you know some some information about the, about the historical backgrounds of the story, uh, uh, is necessary in order to have a meaningful visit to uh, to the house. No, thank you very much. Uh, the next one's for Darius on uh, anti-Semitism. You know, Darius, uh, do you find that your institution uh, deals with or is affected by the uprise in anti-Semitism uh, that that uh, we've commented on? Well, well certainly, uh, you cannot tell the history of Polish Jews without uh, introducing anti-Semitism. Well. We, we, we use this, the term only for the sections beginning in the 19th century when the, when the, when the name anti-Semitism was invented by the anti-Semites themselves. So the museum speaks about the Christian anti-Judaism in the Middle Ages and then the Counter-Reformation, which had a strong anti-Judaic component in, in Eastern Europe. And then we speak about the modern anti-Semitism, which is based on the pseudo-scientific arguments and conspiracy theories that became popular in the late 19th and early, early 20th century, and including, you know, the the, the anti-Jewish policies of the communist regime in, in Poland in the post-war period with much smaller Jewish community, the survivor community remaining in Poland. But at present, we, we have noted a number of, of uh, um, very dangerous tendencies um, uh, which are mutually correlated. That means there is a, a positive feedback mechanism between them. One of them is uh, certain degradation or the, uh, or the attacks, open attacks against expert knowledge of historians. Um, second is the rise of kind of a generalized xenophobia. Uh, you know, it's when I explain it to my friends in Israel, it's, there is, they have a little problem, but in Poland, most of the people who hate the Jews hate the Muslims at the same time. So uh, when you're xenophobic, it's difficult to be selective. Um, and finally, we have the rise of the populist politics in the last decade in all of Europe, and not only in Europe, but especially in Poland. We have a populist party in the government, which is very pro-Israeli. And it uh, stresses it's anti-anti-Semitic, but it exploits the xenophobic sentiments, including anti-Jewish sentiments in everyday life. So we have followed it. We have made the conferences. We, it's an important topic in our education. However, we don't want to reduce the history of Polish Jews to the history of anti-Semitism. 
Anti-Semitism belongs much more to the history of non-Jews. It, of course, it has shaped the life of the Jews. Sometimes it has impacted on the death of the Jews, but it's much more a topic for general museums and not only for the museums of Jewish history. No, thanks for that. And, and this one, I'll, I'll open it up to the to the panel and uh, and even you as well. You know, the, the the evidence of the Holocaust is irre irrefutable. You know, why do you think uh, some people still deny that it happened? So, uh, Sarah, it looks like you'd like to start. Well, I'll, I'll just, first of all, I'll go back to the, uh, our exhibit begins with a quote by General Eisenhower. I think it's appropriate in this setting to uh, invoke him. He himself, uh, and he only witnessed what the camp he went to visit was, I'll just say, just a concentration camp. He did not see uh, Auschwitz or another extermination center, as that was liberated by the Soviets. But he himself, having read the reports for many years of German atrocities, so he, he shouldn't have been surprised, but it was beyond what he was expecting. And uh, so he predicted at that point that people would come to uh, say this never happened. Um, so that's, I think, part of it. And the other is clearly uh, denial is just another form of anti-Semitism. Uh, Darius kind of alluded to this, that anti-Semitism is a very uh, adaptable phenomenon. It, it, it exists in religious societies, secular societies, uh, in democracies, in authoritarian societies, it, it really adapts to, to any environment, even even places that don't even have Jews or never did. So uh, it's just another form of anti-Semitism that emerged um, after World War II. Mike, I have found a, a interesting way of dealing with this in the classroom. <clears throat> One of the few times I guess I thought uh, on my feet successfully. So. Uh, a student asked, probably having heard something from their parents, well, I heard the Holocaust didn't happen. How can you prove that it happened? Uh, and so I said to them, all right, I am going to be a Civil War denier. Right? I don't believe that the Civil War ever happened. Prove to me that the Civil War happened. And of course, they would give me every sort of kind of, well, we have diaries and we have letters and we have photographs and we have histories and all of all of that. And I would use denial arguments for each category of evidence. And my students just got more frustrated and more frustrated. And it was quite effective. And we also have now uh, a, a really substantive literature. Um, uh, Deborah Lipstadt celebrated uh, a uh, trial with with David Irving, um, uh, for example. Um, and so there's there are ways to, uh, uh, in my opinion, there are ways to deal with this. And you know, it, it's kind of murder of memory and and murder of history. And it's not just the Holocaust. I mean, for heaven's sake, we have people denying that the, that the children in Newtown were uh, were killed. That this was just an act by uh, anti-gun lobbyists. So this this is a real issue. No, thanks for that. And uh, Ronald Darius, would you like to, uh, to jump in on this one? Uh, I may add that there was very little negationism in Poland. Really, few cases, and in most cases, just imported, translated from other languages, coming from Western Europe or North America, actually, and being served on servers exploiting American freedom of speech to, to provide negationist arguments to the Polish public in, in, in Polish. And the reason was very simple. We had too many eyewitnesses to the Holocaust, as I have mentioned. Too many people, you know, family members, cousins, relatives, were telling what It was difficult to, to deny it completely. What we see and growing is the distortion of the Holocaust history. In particular, as I said, inflating the scale of assistance offered to the Jews by, by the Christian population and minimizing the scale of, of, of complicity uh, or, or, or indifference to the fate of the Jews. And mm -hmm. this is, in practical terms, this is a much more difficult problem than, than the Holocaust denial. Ronald? Yes, I can only agree with uh, what Darius and, uh, and Sarah just uh, just mentioned. I think uh, distortion is uh, is becoming increasingly a, a, a greater danger than the negotiation negationism that I I really don't see 
growing here in uh, in the Netherlands, uh, but also from, and I think that's another interesting uh, element. We haven't uh, discussed that yet, but you know, we see also other narratives from the past um, that are becoming more and more visible and and are being more and more uh, in, the, in terms of uh, the colonization and slavery that are taking a different position in relation to Holocaust memory. And I think that's also something that 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 this uh, might become relevant in this uh, in in this respect. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, the, the next question is uh, for Sarah, and uh, you know certainly our other other panelists will have uh, views as well. You know, Sarah, why is the Holocaust not a priority in social studies anymore? You know, what can teachers do to make sure that students learn about the Holocaust, and when it is not uh, specifically part of the curriculum? Well, it's a great question, and we're actually looking into this carefully. Um, a lot of this has to do with all the many, many demands on teachers in the country. Um, there's, they have a lot on their plates. They're, they often feel under-supported. They need additional training and things like this. We're trying to figure out how we can address this problem. And I think since Ronald is on this today, it's appropriate to say that, for example, Anne Frank is still so popular. and. That now reading Anne Frank is becoming, uh, you know, important as this as it's kind of moving to the uh, literature side, the, the language art side. So we're trying to do just what the Anne Frank House is doing: is can we help teachers provide that historical framework and understand, you know, why did Anne Frank's family uh, have to leave Germany? Why were they targeted by the Nazis? What was the nature of that ideology? Um, what was uh, what was the result of the war in the Netherlands and the German occupation? And answer all those questions that I talked about before. Not only just what happened to Anne Frank, but but why did it happen? And maybe imply what were some of the op options. So she's also she's a victim of being helped. She's a a victim who was helped, also a victim who was turned in. So there's a lot of rich historical context you could provide, but just reading the diary alone will not do that. No, thank you very much. And, and uh, briefly, we've got uh, just time for uh, one more quick one from each of you. You know, I'd be interested in what role do you think films have, have had in creating our perceptions of the Holocaust? This is going to be the lightning round. And, and maybe, uh, you know, um, Ronald, we'll start with you and, and then Darius and then Sarah. Oh, I'm not sure I'm the expert in uh, in the field, but uh, what I do know is uh, is actually that I think uh, the story of Anne, uh, when the diary was first published in the Netherlands in 1947, it was it was kind of you know popular during two three years, and then then it disappeared from 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 public interest until the uh, the play on Broadway and the film by George Stevens in 1959, and that gave a huge boost to the story, and it never stopped. So I think, um, and, and I'm sure Sarah and Darius can, can add to, to other films, I think bringing it to public memory, uh, I think the, 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 the role of films can hardly be underestimated. Well, thanks. Real quick, uh, uh, Darius, Sarah, any quick thoughts? Well, I may only add that films, at least good films, they combine the power of the visual and the power of storytelling. So a good film is a story which is visual. And in this sense, it's very similar to the museums like the Holocaust Memorial Museums or the Pauline Museum in Warsaw. They use the similar instruments to convey, visual instruments to convey a story. And the question is just to have good quality films that are on the Holocaust, that not all of them are good quality. Sarah? I agree, and I would just say popular culture is very important. Hey, thanks for that. And thanks to, uh, to Ed, to our, our chair, to our panelists, Sarah, Ronald, Darius, you know, another uh, really exceptional, provocative session. You know, thanks to our audience out there for submitting some uh, thoughtful questions as well. And, you know, please keep those coming today and tomorrow. We'll get to as many as possible. And, and just thank you for your engagement.